So good afternoon, evening, morning. Um, welcome from whatever bioregion of this amazing planet you happen to be logging in from. Um, and welcome to our opening plenary for Dear Earth, Innovating Religious Education Through the Lens of Climate Justice. As one of the program chairs for this conference, I'm excited to be introducing you to our animators for this plenary. We've got a wonderful group of people. Um, and one of the benefits uh, for Dory and I of being the program chairs is we get to um, introduce you folks to some of the folks who have really been influencing us. And that is very true for this evening's, um, this evening's panel. Um, so the topic for this session is Refugee of Futures and Corridors of Belonging, Nurturing Humans for Climate Realities Across Faiths and Places. And I just invite you, we'll be um, beginning Deborah Reinstra, who I'll introduce in a minute, will be facilitating this session. Um, and there will be time for the presenters to present. And then towards the end, there'll be an opportunity for all you to engage with your questions and comments and reflections. So I just invite you in that period and as you're listening to be listening with a spirit of curiosity and to be listening actively and to be practicing generosity and assuming others' good intentions. Um, and please, as much as possible, to stick to the session topic in your questions, excuse me, and your responses. So the trio of folks that we have tonight, um, Deborah Reinstra, um, her writing and podcast have really helped me and the work that I've been doing this past year with folks in small congregations as they're seeking to become vibrant and um, resilient communities in a climate changed world. Melanie Harris's work on eco-womanism has informed and broadened my teaching on eco-spirituality and climate justice at Boston University School of Theology. And Daniel Fore's work has greatly influenced Dory's writing, leadership and life, helping her access ancestral medicine as a source of support for the work of justice making. Before I formally introduce these folks, um, I just wanna invite us into a moment of centering so if you feel comfortable doing so, close your eyes, take in a few deep breaths and let them out. And if you're able to do so, to plant your feet on the floor in whatever way works for you to imagine your roots sinking deep into dear earth. offering our intention and our love and receiving nurture and love in return. Now let us begin. Facilitating the conversation this evening or afternoon or morning, wherever you are, will be Deborah Reinstra. Deborah is professor of English at Calvin University. Her most recent book is Refugee of Faith, Seeking Hidden Shelters, Ordinary Wonders, and the Healing of Earth, which was uh, Healing of the Earth, which was published by Fortress in 2022. Reinster is also the host of the Refugia podcast and writes bi-weekly for the Reformed Journal. Daniel Four is a doctor of psychology, experienced ritualist, and the author of Ancestral Medicine, Rituals for Personal and Family Healing. He's an initiate in the Orisha, in the Orisha tradition of the Yoruba-speaking West Africa and has learned from teachers of Mahayana Buddhism, Islamic Sufism, and older ways of his English and German ancestors. Daniel is the founder and director at Ancestral Medicine and is passionate about training aspiring leaders and change makers in the intersections of cultural healing, animist ethics, and applied ritual arts. 
He lives with his wife and two daughters near Granada, Spain, in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada Mountains. Dr. Melanie Harris is Director of Food, Health, and Ecological Well-Being and Professor of Black Feminist and Womanist Theologies, jointly appointed with African American Studies and the School of Wake Forest Divinity at Wake Forest University. Her leadership, teaching, research, and scholarship focus on the area of religious social ethics, environmental justice, womanist ethics, and African American religion. Dr. Harris is the author of Eco-Womanism, African American Women and Earth Honoring Faiths, and of Gifts of Virtue, Alice Walker and Womanist Ethics, as well as being co-editor of the volume Faith, Feminism, and Scholarship, The Next Generation. She's published widely in the field of leadership ethics, access in higher education, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and eco-womanism, a fresh and emerging discourse on ecology, ecology and religion. With that, I'll turn it over to Deborah for the conversation between Deborah, Daniel, and Melanie. Thank you, Wanda. I am so honored and privileged to be here among you all. Thank you, Wanda and Dory, for organizing this. Very excited to hear the wisdom of Daniel and Melanie and have a conversation. So I think what I'll do is uh, share with you some ideas for about 20 minutes. And then I'll ask Melanie and Daniel each to respond. And then we'll have a little time to talk to each other with the three of us. Uh, but I hope that meanwhile, all of you participants will be thinking about how you would like to respond and questions that you have. We will definitely save some time for that uh, toward the end. So I'm gonna share my screen and get started. Okay, hang on here, we're coming. All right, looking good, everybody. Okay, so uh, you've heard this word refugia and I'm going to be defining that in a little bit. It's actually, I think most useful if you think of it as a kind of useful metaphor for a way to imagine our role as people of faith and conscience in this moment in history. So I'll be explaining that a little bit. Um, but to back up first, I want to think about religious education on kind of a meta level and ask the big fundamental question, what are we forming people for? And one way or another, we are answering those questions, whether we're doing it very consciously and intentionally, or whether we're doing it inadvertently, we are answering these big questions for people. What's wrong in this world and how do we fix it if we can fix it? What is our role as humans on this earth? What is the good life and how do we get it? So I'm coming to you from a white Christian point of view. Um, I have kind of one foot in the evangelical world, one foot, I'm, I'm actually reformed. So it's sort of this place between mainline and evangelical. So I'm gonna come to this from that point of view, but I hope that you'll all be thinking about your own context, your own faith commitments and traditions, um, how you might think about these things. That'll be an important part of our discussion later. So I'm gonna start with a really unfair, highly reductive view <laughs> of typical Christian formation. And I'm thinking primarily of North American white evangelicalism, but this view you will recognize is so influential that it's not irrelevant really to anybody. Um, but I just wanna make sure that's, that's an understanding of where I'm starting here. So the way people are often formed in these spaces is to answer the question of what's wrong, the answer is individual sin. Um, and then how do we fix this? And here's the evangelical answer, accept Jesus, join a church, and then you live these holy lives, right? There's this conversion. We had this whole session thinking about conversion uh, a little while ago. So to continue that, then what is religious education for? Well, to support those holy lives, let you know what that means. And then evangelism, convert others. And then there's 
as far as systemic work, it's often seen as helping those less fortunate. There's a kind of charity model behind it rather than a more systemic model that I'll talk about in just a second. And also, I think this is really important to recognize too. Um, the, the way that we are formed in these spaces, and by we, I mean people that are in my context, is that there's also this assumption that all of this is completely compatible with the American dream. In other words, we want prosperity. And that's either said right out loud or it's implied. And I say this as somebody who teaches at a religious university where we're sort of offering as one of our products of education, um, even if it's a religious education, this sort of ticket to a good job, a good life, the American dream. So just to right away get with some prop, get to some problems with this, well, if that's what we're forming people for, this leaves us complicit, complicit with and uncritical of empire colonialism in all of its forms. Um, it allows us to functionally ignore the rest of creation beyond our individual human souls. The, the work of God is about individual human souls and really the rest of the earth, our bodies even, uh, as a kind of disposable stage for this drama of human redemption. Now, once again, this is a reductive view, but functionally, this is how a lot of people operate because this is how they've been formed. So what is eclipsed with this? And here I begin with the Hebrew scriptures there's some matters of biblical witness that are eclipsed with this view of what religious education is for. And one is this foundational goodness of all, all of creation and the belovedness of all of creation. And then in Genesis two, the human vocation of serving and protecting and observing, Abad and Shamar are the Hebrew words, um, this originary human vocation that's often reduced to dominionism from Genesis 1, or, or this kind of low impact stewardship where it's really about an advantageous use of resources. For Christians, the New Testament also gives some other biblical witness things that we don't fully grapple with in our formation, I would argue. Um, Romans 8, all creation groaning toward liberation. Colossians 1, Christ reconciling all things to himself in earth and heaven. And then the vision and revelation of a renewed earth, not just sweep it away and start new, and not just disembodied souls in heaven, but a renewed earth, this big view of redemption. So what is missing in this kind of typical and reductive religious formation is a robust theology of the earth that includes the earth's belovedness and our kinship. We can't really even talk about our separation from the more than human creation. We are embedded in it, kin with it. And that also entails this kind of big view of redemption, all things, all creation on this path of redemption. Uh, other things that are missing, practices of earth learning and earth healing, and then grief, some way of dealing with grief over loss and environmental injustice. Another thing that seems to be missing is a sense of moral urgency. And I'll illustrate that with some poll data in just a second. And then love and attention to all of God's beloved creation. Now, all of you are here because you're interested in all of these things, but uh, here's some, polling data uh, from a Pew study from a couple years ago. The, um, the data was actually from March of 22, so it's a couple years old, but PRRI has more uh, recent data that verifies all of this too. So this was an answer to the question, what are US churches actually doing about climate? And it wasn't just Christian churches. They asked about other things to, or other faith communities as well. Um, but at least for churches, the bottom line was that religion overall actually seems to get in the way of taking climate change seriously. And that's a formation problem, right? An education problem among other things. And this statistic really bothers me. <laughs> Only 8% of all Americans are both highly religious, this is all religions, highly religious 
and very concerned about climate change. Now, 8% is actually a lot of people, but considering how generally religious Americans are, this is very alarming data. Uh, this may not surprise you, evangelical Protestants were the least likely to believe that global warming is caused by human activities. And this is definitely borne out in the PRRI research later. And then this is one that maybe you've heard these statistics too. We just aren't talking about it. So that's also an education and formation problem. 78% seldom or never talk about climate change with members of their congregation. And this is across faiths as well. So the conclusion of the Pew Research Center is that we are more shaped by economic and political influences than by religious claims. It's probably, if you're American, this is not gonna surprise you. Uh, I'd be very curious to know what this looks like elsewhere in the world. So we are facing, you know, as you realize, many kinds of crisis. The climate crisis is one of them, one of these crises, but there are other kinds of crises going on too. And that's very uncomfortable, anguishing, but it is a time to ask, what if things could be different? What if we can imagine our role and purpose differently, not just as humans, but in particular for our context as people of faith? And for me, that question about imagination is so crucial. We talked about that in the last session as well. Um, because I'm a literature person, I'm always thinking about what is going on in our imaginations and how powerful the imaginaries that are formed in our minds are in shaping our behavior, our attitudes, uh, our social practices. So as I've been uh, thinking about this over the past, I don't know, seven, eight years, I came across this idea of refugia that has seemed to be really descriptive, but also really helpful in imagining a different way. So. What if we imagine ourselves as people of faith, as people of refugia? That's been the question I've been grappling with. So now I will define refugia. Refugia is a biological term. Uh, it's been active in biological research and practice for quite a long time. And the definition now is this, refugia are these habitats that components of biodiversity retreat to, persist in, and can potentially expand from under changing environmental conditions. So the best example of this comes from Kathleen Dean Moore's book, Great Tide Rising, where she describes the eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980 and how that was so incredibly destructive. The side of that mountain, so this was the eruption, right? The side of that mountain was covered with ash. The eruption just blew down the trees and biologists looked at this eruption and said, yeah, we're not going to see anything green on this mountainside for decades, if not centuries. But 25 years later, the mountainside looked like this image that you're seeing right now. And so biologists thought, well, what happened? You know, what are we missing here? And what they were missing was these refugia, tiny little pockets of life, even under this layer of ash that survived and then expanded and connected and grew. These were places where life survived in an enormous crisis. And as soon as I read about this concept, I immediately thought, what an amazing metaphor. That's what English professors do, right? We are always thinking in terms of metaphor. What if we think about those places, not just in the natural world, the more than human creation, but in our social and spiritual and cultural lives where capacities survive? Um, extreme disturbance, life-giving capacity survive, and then begin to create this renewal. They connect, they expand, they transform, and they create this renewal. And that just seemed to me like a really powerful metaphor for how we can think of ourselves as people of faith. So in nature, refugia are meaningful because they have several functions. They protect in the midst of the crisis, but they transform they connect and revive. They're not bunkers, they have permeable boundaries. Um, so the, the whole idea of them is it's a mechanism of resilience, but they are also very particular to context in place and time and in biology to species. So a refugia, uh, for example, for freshwater fish, um, 
might be great for the fish, but it might be more difficult for the plants. It depends on the species. So that's something to keep in mind too. So this mechanism of resilience, um, I think for educators, it's a way to imagine our role, but it's also a way to think about education. It's a space to build change. So this moment that we're living in, this historical moment right now, demands that we become resilient healers. Some people have been doing this for centuries and we need to learn from them, but all of us need to participate in this. So the question becomes, how can we find where this refugia work has been happening and how can we nurture new refugia, um, not only in the earth and in the earth systems, but in our human cultural systems and in our spiritual contexts as well. So I, I wrote a book that sort of tried to answer this question. What does it mean to go on this journey of trying to become a, a person of refugia as a person of faith? And I came up with seven sort of categories and I just present these to you to sort of spark your imagination a little bit. I came up with these transformations um, and they very nicely mapped on the Christian liturgical year, which I thought was kind of cool. So it was just a way to sort of organize um, theological categories and organized stories and so on. But I think these pertain, these pertain across faiths. And I think they can pertain even, you know, just in the general context. So these transformations that we're called to right now, from despair to preparation. So rather than just being in despair, thinking this as a time of preparation for what's coming, uh, from alienation from the rest of the created world to kinship, from thinking of ourselves as consumers to thinking of ourselves as healers, from avoiding what's happening to engaging in lament, from resignation, no, we can't do anything about this, or this is just life, or God, God will fix this, or anything like that, to a sense of gratitude. It's an interesting transformation. From passivity to citizenship, and then from indifference to attention. So I'll let you just kind of think about those as we go forward. So I thought it would be helpful to just have a couple examples of what I would consider refugia um, in religious contexts. So I'm just thrilled to introduce you to Reverend Dr. Heber Brown, who's actually presenting at this conference as well. I'm looking forward to his session. Um, so Reverend Dr. Brown, Con conceived of and started with his church congregation, the Black Food Security Network in the um, Atlantic Seaboard area. He's in Baltimore himself. And they started with just a church garden. Uh, and it really came out of his concern as a pastor for the health of his congregants and how he was seeing so many diet related health issues. He was always visiting people in the hospital. And his question was then, all right, well, how can we build uh, life-giving capacities? So they started with a church garden, and that led to a church farmer's market, and that led to sourcing vegetables in the city from this whole network. So you can see the, the way this fits that refugia paradigm, where you start with this small space, and you nurture these life-giving capacities, and it connects, and it grows and creates a kind of different ecosystem. Here's another very different example. This is from my university. We engage in watershed work through the Plaster Creek Stewards. This is religiously motivated watershed work. Um, so it's about ecosystem restoration of this very polluted urban watershed um, and the creek itself. And what the Plaster Creek Stewards do is they're based in the university, but they work with community partners, uh, including just individual volunteers and they do what's called reconciliation ecology. So it's not just the natural parts of this, but it's the social uh, relationships that have, the historical social relationships that have led to this pollution and led to alienation and economic and um, environmental racial disadvantage in our community. So it's a holistic approach to creating these refugia spaces. Um, they do education, they do research, and they do very practical restoration work. So those are just a couple examples. We could talk about many, many more. But to sum up how refugia as a way of thinking is meaningful in human culture, it's because these refugia spaces provide relatively safe spaces to cultivate health 
and health in terms of ecosystem, cultural health, spiritual health, community health. Um, and they create freedom to experiment. So I think that's really important to remember as educators is these little refugia spaces create experimental spots where you can try things and iterate and see what works. And one of the things that's been really encouraging as I talk to people about this idea is the idea that what is small is not necessarily insignificant. And in fact, these refugia spaces, I mean, think of that mountainside and Mount St. Helens, these were tiny pockets, but we see this too in human culture and in, in faith communities that something small can have big significance, not only as itself, but in the way that it connects and influences. Uh, refugia are inclusive because they have permeable edges. They can influence through a network of connections. And this is something I have experienced over and over again these are spaces not only of challenge, but also of joy, because you are working for what is life-giving and you are participating in this with community. So I'll uh, conclude with this word from Reverend Jim Antall, who's a United Church of Christ pastor who's been in climate work for decades. Um, I love the way that he thinks of our call as people of faith now as a communal call, and indeed beyond people of faith, um, a communal call because of this moment in history. And he describes it as an inescapable moral claim on our whole generation and on every one of us. And it requires a lot of fresh understandings. So he, he lists human freedom, fulfillment, vocation, salvation. And I just offer this refugia metaphor as a way of gathering those ideas together and saying, we can sum this all up by saying we want to be the people of refugia and form our communities as people of refugia. So I'll end there. Let me stop sharing here a minute. Okay. And I'd like to invite now a response from Melanie. So Melanie, hello. And I'm so honored to be talking with you. Um, so here's the question I would invite you to respond to, and please respond in whatever way you like. Here's my question. How might you draw from your eco-womanist work, your work with eco-womanism, to expand on or modify this idea of refugia or of imagining ourselves as people of refugia? And I wonder if you could talk about practices that you might describe as refugia practices, and particularly intersectionality. So is there anything in this little idea, this metaphor that could advance our intersectional, intersectional awareness and learning? Thank you, Deborah, And thank you all so much. It's a gift to be here with you. Really appreciate the deep opening here in terms of this concept and moving in climate justice work. I'll share a little bit about eco-womanism first, just for those who may not know about the perspective. Eco-womanism is a perspective in climate justice work and certainly in environmental ethics that really centers the voices of women of African descent. And so it looks primarily at African-American women, women from across the African diaspora and the particular strategies and ways of being that they have been with the earth historically and the way that they are with the earth now, particularly in the work of climate justice. We know that from the Black Lives Matters movement, for example, and many movements, Black women are actually some of the heads of a lot of social movements happening. And the same is true for environmental justice. It's just that we haven't really seen environmentalism from that light or that perspective. So I think in thinking about your question about refugia, I might invite an eco-womanist perspective for us to consider just that. If we were to center some of the African-American lives and their work, we might consider the call of Harriet Tubman and the work that she did in creating these kinds of refuge spaces not just along the Underground Railroad, but the echoes that that has had for descendants of African Americans and really permeated the ways that we think about safety and refuge even in this time. 
So we'll remember the Underground Railroad as being a highly interracial abolitionist project in that it wasn't just African-American families, but many white families, actually, many abolitionist white families who knew something even then about the work of um, anti-racism. They knew something about the debilitating logic of domination that was at the forefront, at the base of the system of slavery. They knew something enough to recognize that black people were as human as anyone else, that they were sacred beings too. So this awakening, I think, is one of the awakenings that happens a lot of times, even in our work today. And oftentimes it does happen in the work of doing what your school happens to be doing, um, what you call reconciliation ecology. Um, when we think about Harriet Tubman, when we think about um, Dorothy Height, when we think about all of the African-American women primarily who have been engaged in climate justice work, what we recognize is actually these women have been at the forefront of doing these kinds of space creations, um, certainly a space of refuge, not just for the bodies of African-Americans and African-American peoples, but really for the bodies of the earth, lots of different beings. One of the things that's important about eco-womanism is that it does build on a different kind of cosmology. So I really appreciated, Deborah, you sharing a little bit more about the kind of white Protestant way of coming into the conversation. That's what most of us are used to and familiar with. In fact, eco-womanism is really based on kind of African-centered indigenous religious traditions, condomble being one, but also a deep sense of sacredness and being with the earth. So that certain kind of connectedness. This intersectionality then that is used as a part of the component, a part of the method of eco-womanism is not just looking at differences like race, class, and gender, and thinking about how those, the, what we call tripartite analysis, bring those three aspects into any form of critique of environmental uh, racism, for example, or any part of the crisis. But it's also to weave in the earth. That is to say, what is most just for the earth? What is most just for all beings on the earth? In the work of Larry Rasmussen and other great environmental ethicists, we do see the step back into intersectional analysis by really listening to different aspects of the earth. What would fire say? How would air react? How is water singing differently in this moment? How might we envision the four elements of earth and their song? in this particular moment? What do they need or what are they asking us? One of the gifts of intersectional analysis is that it begins to bring back some important layers, but it also asks us some really hard questions. So particularly for eco-womanism, even in this thinking through the three basic layers, we are invited to ask, how does race matter in environmental injustice? when we witness environmental injustice in our neighborhoods or in our cities, we do have to ask the question, what is disproportionate about the climate injustice that's happening racially? When we think about economics or class, we ask the same question, what is significant about the, the economic base or the reality of stratification, economic stratification, and the ways that environmental injustice is impacting one group of people over or against another group of people. And the same is true with gender, that eco-womanist analysis in that kind of intersectional way invites us to ask specific questions about gendered bodies. How does environmental injustice uh, whether it's air pollution or water pollution, how does it impact the ability for a human woman to reproduce? How are children's um, systems uh, debilitated by lead poisoning, et cetera? By taking a deep step into these three questions using intersectional analysis, eco-womanism suggests that we can find our way towards building more solutions um, in a more connected way. So again, when I think about refugia and the way that you suggested it, it not only echoes deeply into intersectional analysis, such as it's already suggested in eco-womanism, but it actually builds on that. 
that and actually suggest that there is something even more uh, important about unlayering what is the impact on water? How does water react? What is the impact on water song as a result of environmental justice? And then moving through each component in the way that it might be held in African cosmology. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. So much to come back to and ponder there. We're gonna give Daniel a chance to respond and then we'll get a chance to uh, ask one another some questions. So Daniel, um, would, you, would you tell us a little bit about your work from an animist standpoint and how that might teach us about kinship? That's one of the words that has come up already. And then I, I would love to have you talk about practices, what practices seem to most helpfully undermine dualisms, the dualisms that we struggle to transcend. And some of these are uh, religiously, they, they are based in some religious ideas as well. So I'm thinking spiritual, phys physical, human, as opposed to the more than human creation and so on. Yeah. Thank you, Wanda, Deborah, Melanie. Thank you all for your trust. I assume the tech is coming through. You can hear me okay. Yeah. Uh, appreciate you all for your care and attention. Uh, I know with the introduction, I feel a little bit situated already, but it is an important part of my own ethic to be clear where I'm speaking from. So I am ancestrally down lineage from early English and German settler colonialist in North America. I'm actually back for the summer in North Carolina, which is traditional Cispaha, Cherokee, Lumbi, uh, Catawba lands of many different indigenous peoples. And so acknowledgement to the rough histories here. Uh, I'll say just on this topic of, I mean, we'll see how far we get in 10 minutes. It's a big topic. There's a lot to say. But I want to speak from a, a kind of personal embodied sense uh, of refugia, or refugia. Like, do I feel safe in this space? So I'm noticing in the 25 years maybe of public teaching and speaking, I think it's maybe the second time I've ever been invited by any Christian or Christian adjacent group to talk about anything related to this. So like demographically, insofar, insofar as I'm gonna to generalize to make the conversation lively, y'all are in the enemy camp of like, like worldview wise. And I wanna like unpackage that because the question of, am I safe? Who's safe? Refuge for who? So that brings us to the question first of uh, supremacy. And how do we not have the really wholesome ethic of being a place of refuge be a replication of white supremacy, American imperialism, patriarchy, whatever it might be. How do we not recreate that ethic? And so supremacy in, in that sense, uh, it, if, we, if I think of what I associate with the, like the shadow of an institution that one would associate with, and all groups have their you know, imbalanced thing, we're human, with the church, or even if we narrow it to like Protestant expressions of Christianity, there's there's the Christian Zionism that's fueling the genocide uh, in Palestine. There's long histories of white supremacy. There is ongoing, not just histories. There's you know the patriarchy. There's the being exclusive uh, or judgmental toward queer and trans folks, and there's a. a hostility, not always, but sometimes toward pagan, earth-honoring, animist traditions. And, it, you know, we could go on, but it, at least those are, it's a starting point to know if the intent to have refuge just for other living humans, if we, if we narrow it just to that, to say, if we want to do that, there needs to be an explicit reckoning with histories of institutional misuse of power to proactively communicate welcome and care and love to folks of backgrounds that have been harmed either personally or ancestrally, generationally, by those institutional misuses of power. Uh, otherwise, it's a, uh, an acceptance of we're just going to perpetuate this kind of supremacy because it's part of our identity and we're not going to question it. Okay, but it compromises the ability to be effective and the intent to be a place of refuge. And it, it it's less loving, frankly. And so beyond that, the same pattern of supremacy that we could talk about within 
human communities extends to the human other than human relationships. We can call it human supremacy, anthropocentrism, just the idea that humans are somehow above the others, the other than humans. This is really deeply baked in culturally, unless it's been examined, unless you've been raised in a sort of more indigenous or more earth honoring community, it's going to often be an unconscious thing unless you've encountered teachings to the contrary. And animism is one way of affirming this value set that basically says humans are not the only kind of person. There are many other kinds of people. Some of those people are human shaped, but not physically incarnate, like the human dead or the ancestors. But many of them, like the spirits of plants or animals or mountains or deities or angels or whatever it is, are not human in form, but are nonetheless people. They're kin. They're part of our extended relational network. And if we wish to be a place of refuge or a community of refuge, uh, and, and we're starting on a personal level, like, can I hold this ethic aside from whatever institution I might build? Is my heart actually affirming the personhood, the reality, the, re the relational value of these other than human kin? Uh, that is an animist ethic that is shared generally by most indigenous people on earth. And then for the 95% of humans who are not indigenous, many folks also share an animist ethic, but it's often been interrupted in our lineages. There's also often in places where we, it has broken down. And so in that process of reclaiming, we can ask, you know, when we're out planting trees along Plaster Creek, has anyone stopped to greet the trees directly? Has anyone asked the stream if it wants trees there? Has anyone asked the spirit of the trees if they, if it's that species that would be there? I mean, it's probably a good guess. It seems like wholesome work, but there's a relational etiquette piece where if you come into a community and you're like, I know what you need. Let me just do what I'm telling you you need. You've done that colonialist white savior mentality thing. And we can really easily bring that unintentionally to how we relate with the other than humans. And one of the practices, I know the time is limited, but one of the practices is uh, slowing down and asking for consent and listening. Just holding the question like, we have this idea that'd be good to plant some trees here. We have the idea we're gonna do this project. Is this welcome? And if it, you know, if you get a yes, then you proceed. That kind of being consent-minded helps. And um, so the what I would say also is that healthy human culture, ideally, if, if part of what we are realizing, it's like, oh, we're in a big mess. We have an ecological catastrophe. There's tremendous uh, inequality, multiple genocides unfolding. It's, it's a tough moment with prognosis to deepen what if we're attempting to be cultural agents what are some principles that are useful another is that we don't if we don't want to replicate human supremacy then we need to include the other than humans in how we source new cultural forms what is it to actually create with the land with the ancestors to listen to the spirits of place and if that is a new and different thing then it can be learned it's like, oh, I, I conceptually get the importance of it and I'm not sure how to do it. Then it's like, oh, then I have some learning to do. No problem. I wasn't raised with any of this stuff and I sought it out and have learned. And so it's a learnable thing. I'm still learning, of course, but it um, is possible to reclaim those capacities for relationship, which is really about learning to be more effective at loving and to expand the field of how well and effective way we can love. Because until we recognize others as full people, we can see this pattern in histories and ongoing like oppressive patterns. When we dehumanize a person, we're depersonifying them. We're, we're seeing them as part object, not, not a full person. When we do that, of course, it enables bad behavior and it's painful all around. It leads to bad outcomes. 
So the correction is to affirm the personhood, the sentience, the intelligence, the value of others, not only humans. This There's nothing in any way that I view about this ethic to be antithetical to the teachings of Christianity, as I understand them. I'm not a practicing Christian, but I have respect for different faith communities. But too often within the tradition, there can be a narrative that somehow positions animist or pagan or earth honoring things as in tension with Christianity. And, and that functions, it can function as a block or a barrier to, re, to fully taking the step of, so you can see things as God's creation, but if you go into a neighborhood, like if, if you're a white person, you go into a black neighborhood and be like, oh, this is all God's creation. And the, the people in the neighborhood are like, what you're bringing is not what we need. And you're like, oh, that's nice, but you're God's creation. We're going to do it anyways. People are going to be like, you're rude. Why? Like, what are you doing? You're not listening. It's not, it's not a relationship anymore. Uh, and so they're like being specific where we validate the voices, the personhood, and the experiences of the others, it's a cultural shift. It's a reclaiming of our innate capacity to extend how we think of meaningful, intimate relationships to include the other than humans. It's learnable and it is, uh, I, it's what I've dedicated my life to. It's what I've been doing for the last 25 years, maybe. And yeah, and, and I'll just say, I know I need to finish with time, but I'll say it again that it, um, it doesn't surprise me that it's just 8%. It's sad, and so I respect the work that's happening here. But uh, I'll say that it's like a, um, it's a lift to bring these sensibilities into this particular, into uh, not to assume where y'all are coming from, but like into the cultural space of generally Protestant forms of Christianity. And so, uh, thanks for doing that. I hope. That lands okay, and I'm looking forward to the dialogue. Let me keep it within my time. Thanks. It lands beautifully, Daniel. Thank you, and I'm so grateful for the richness of all the things that you said, and for the resonance that at least I'm feeling with um, so much of what we're all talking about here at this conference. Um, lots of things to respond to there, but I want to give Melanie a chance to respond first. Melanie, what are you hearing that is resonating for you or that you would like to uh, take a thread and pull on it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you, Daniel, so much. I must admit it's a gift to um, see in a kind way, um, in a kin way. Uh, one of the practices that is really an, an important frame, I think, for all of eco womanist thought is a African cosmology in which animism is certainly uh, reflective in in really powerful ways, whereby the, everything is connected. Um, so the human realm is connected to divine realm and is connected to um, nature realm. And in that, all beings uh, essentially inhabit parts of each realm so that it's very deeply understood that an answer may show up as a tree and an ancestor certainly speaks through nature and ought to be honored as nature and nature ought to be honored just as in, in our own human relationships. So when things are healthy, when the climate is healthy, when relationship is healthy, the circle is moving in a beautiful, beautiful spiral in a beautiful rotation. But when things are out of whack, um, a war or um, violence against women, then there are ways in which the bodies of the earth is impacted by the way that bodies of women and girls are treated, that ancestors' bodies and their spiritual realm is deeply impacted by the violence that is happening to women and girls. So this too is an important way of seeing a kind of lens of deep seeing that allows one to deepen into that practice of love. So I really appreciated Daniel, your sharing that in some level for many religious traditions and many spiritual traditions and even humanists and atheistic traditions, it is a practice of loving that we are moving more deeply into 
And I know that for Christians, most of the tradition of Christian hegemony, really, we assume that we have command over that particular word, L-O-V-E. We have a particular way of theologizing love that necessitates the presence of a typically brown-haired, blue-eyed male Jesus, white male Jesus, and that love can only come through this particular um, embodied persona except for the fact that that persona is exactly the same as the Jim Crow sheriff. It is the exact same persona as uh, many uh, white males who are not a part of, uh, do not consider themselves a part of nature, but consider themselves far above nature and every other being. So when we look at that the opportunity then to step back and to not just criticize, but really wonder, like, what is this image and where, how, who hijacked it? Um, did the earth hijack it? You know, who is the one who placed these hierarchies in place? Who is the one? And then how, I think for Christians to think about how do you save Jesus from that terrifying image of the white slave owner, which is the same whiteness in Jesus Christ. How do you save the tradition from um, these particular images? Solving that question, even from a Christian uh, tradition, I think helps the planet. I think it really deeply helps the planet to interrogate white privilege. I think it very deeply helps the planet to come into these more anti-racist, but also loving ways of seeing, loving ways of being. Um, I'm reminded not just by Dr. Heber Brown's work, but Chris Carter and many of us um, who work in interracial climate justice groups. And in the South, at least here in North Carolina, there are lots of opportunities for African Americans to join with white folks, to join with Latino folks, Asian folks, and, and indigenous folks. And it's often um, the assumption that everyone has the same experience with the earth. And this is hardly the case that most people of color, most indigenous peoples have a very different experience and connection to the earth than those of white ancestry. And paying attention to that is really important for the work of partnership in climate justice work. So we take, for example, the scene of the lynching tree. There is a way in which we have to consider that there is reparations necessary, ecological reparations, not just reconciliation, but reparations is necessary in that moment because the descendants of the white mob are with the descendants of the lynched body of the black person are with the descendants of the tree. And all three of those energies have to be healed to be back into a kind of African cosmolo cosmological sense of peace or union. And one can only do that if you can talk to trees. You know, one can only do that if you can sing with the rhythm of that root and those roots. One can only do that if one knows the songs outside of one's own culture so that it's not enough to just know, sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. A long way from home. A long way from home. Well, that to know that song from the root of the tree and from the African ancestor and from the white lynched mob leader. That's the work. Melanie, do you wanna just sing for the rest of the session? <laughs> I think we'd probably all be 
just fine with that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh, I'll just thank reflect you. on some themes that I'm hearing in this conversation. Um, the theme of safety, creating safety, um, the theme of humility, and the absolute essential need for those who have been in positions of hegemony to adopt postures of humility and be taught. Um, maybe that's something we can talk about, how to do that. Um, I'm also thinking about the theme of destruction and destruction in, you know, refugia as a biological concept is premised on destruction or disturbance as it's called in biology, sometimes very extreme disturbance. Well, we are in a time of disturbance. And so there are things that need to be destroyed. And some of those are ideas and assumptions. And that is often the work of education and formation, but it's difficult work because as you were both saying, I think that destruction will be more felt by some than others who have already been feeling other kinds of destruction. So the you know, we might in Christianity would call this kenosis, self-emptying. That's the kind of destruction that has to happen. Um, a conversion. So as some of the presenters in the last session were talking about, it's a kind of conversion. And that conversion looks very different for those who have been in hegemonic positions. Um, and then the theme of teaching and corridors. You mentioned, Melanie, um, you know, interracial, intergenerational work. It can be such a beautiful space for learning. Um, and I wonder if each of you could maybe say a little bit about the need for those who have been in the center, who've been centered and normalized, to receive teaching from those who have been marginalized, and how that feels for those who have been marginalized for all these people to be saying, oh my gosh, you know things that all of us need to learn now. Um, indigenous people are feeling that, you know? And I, I wonder if you're feeling that in a way, and maybe you could talk about what that's like. Daniel, you go ahead. Sure, thanks. I would say for one that um, supremacy and nobody, most people at least don't set out to be like, I'm gonna be a whatever supremacist today. Uh, I see it as the single biggest obstacle to actual solidarity, to actual community, to actual like movement building. And like, why do working class people not work together more to actually shift all the unequal distribution of wealth? Racism, white racism, mostly. Uh, and, you know, other things but like religious bigotry and like perceived divisions and all that. But the whole notion of different races was created to divide working class people. It's a very American project in the 1600s. Um, so I say that because it's not enough to like not make mistakes, like as a goal around these different kinds of cultural supremacies, but rather to wade intentionally into the mess and make the acute concerns of often more marginalized people your own. Uh, and to, in that, take responsibility for our own education. It's not reasonable. I mean, if it's like people of color or whatever marginalized people are like, you welcome to pay me for my time to be an expert on this, then that's a thing, if, you know, if they make that offer. But it's important to not uh, expect any given group or person who's experienced trouble to be in the educator role, unless that brings them some happiness and probably some money as well. Um, and so in that way, there's an the ethic of taking responsibility for one's own learning. But for me, in terms of the how as a ritualist, the main thing I do, the main thing I teach, I have a whole international organization devoted to this, I do trainings on it, is ancestral healing practice. And it's differently relevant, as Melanie was sharing, to support people of African ancestries compared to African ancestries of, you know, people who are 
uh, historically enslaved in the Americas compared to directly in the moment Yoruba people or whatever it might be. So uh, people of different African ancestries are supporting people who of Greek ancestry who live in Greece compared to people who have lived in the Americas as white settlers for 10 generations. So even like the experience of people connecting with their ancestors is going to really vary depending on what ancestral pain and debts they've inherited. But doing having done a, like a work with a lot of folks over the last 20 years on ancestral repair, uh, what I enjoy about it is it helps people, it creates an off-ramp for the deep toxin, at least in North America, of extreme individualism. And the unconscious conditioning of like extreme individualism and instead creates a sense of belonging that's like, okay, there's a lot of white people, once they have a shred of cultural awakening, feel like trash about themselves. And that's perhaps a useful step on a process of awakening, but it's still white centering. It's actually not that liberatory as a, it's not where you want to end up. And so there needs to be a sense of healthy self-esteem, but that means looking at the rough history of occupation and colonialism and supremacy and saying, okay, my people through all time and space are not actually defined by this. There's a there's a point if I dig deep enough at which we're just regular sized people, not being losers or taking up all the space in the room. Uh, and And so that doesn't happen individually. It has to happen communally. Work with the ancestors is one practice oriented way that I encourage people to get at that because it means claiming and taking on the unpaid debts of our people and saying, I mean, you know, I accept that. I accept these debts. I need to chip away at that. That's part of my responsibility to be an adult culturally. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Melanie, would you like to respond? And then Wanda, I wonder if you could uh, let us know what kinds of questions have been in the chat. I've been watching the chat and focusing on listening. Um, so Melanie, go ahead and respond uh, to Daniel and to my question before or whatever you'd like to say, and then we'll see if there are some questions from the participants. Mm, thank you so much. Oh, Daniel, you've given us a lot to um, move in, which is a gift. I um, concur. I agree. There is a way in which um, the work of environmental thought and um, environmentalism has fallen into the traps of a lot of these pockets um, of supremacy. And um, when we think about the kind of founding fathers of American environmentalism, oftentimes it does not include the voice of Phyllis Tribble, or does it, it does not include the voice of so many indigenous peoples and even native peoples um, who clearly had a different understanding of the earth and of place and space. Um, and there, uh, there is, it's impossible to own the sky. It's impossible to own earth, right? Um, from a very indigenous way of being. So even the concept of trying to build a capitalist system um, involving the earth um, doesn't fit very well. It is important what you've said to name as a person of color, white guilt does not help to liberate the planet. White guilt and staying in white guilt um, does not help to actually liberate anyone. And so there is this real deep echo, I feel important to say that yes, if you're doing environmental work, if you're doing climate justice, you really do need to deepen in your capacity to do anti-racism work and decolonizing work. And as a religious being, as someone who is oriented, particularly in terms of any kind of major mainstream, quote unquote, religious tradition, a lot of that work of moral formation, a lot of that work of spiritual formation happens within one's own faith practice on a day-to-day -day basis. So recognizing the divine in oneself when you look in the mirror, mirror, but really being intentional about recognizing the divine in every single aspect of earth when you get outside, um, recognizing the moment to actually take a breath in to recognize that is full ruach, right? From a kind of Christian or Jewish or Islamic perspective, um, from a Buddhist perspective, recognizing that Buddha nature is indeed in you and in all beings. 
right? Deepening into the moment of actually recognizing that this sacred energy in indigenous traditions, ashe, is in all beings. So no, we should not be living in a society where there is a Trayvon Martin, there is the death of him, there is the grief of his mother. We These realities in our society do not compute with what's possible. And I think engaging in what's possible means that we have to push ourselves, not just into these spaces of humility, but uh, push ourselves out of the comfort zone of guilt and isolating ourselves of falling prey to individualist kind of reading and researching, but not getting engaged in actual relationship. Relationships are hard. And in this kind of metaphor, in the way that you've encouraged us, Deborah, the refugia is going to require relationship. It is going to require this kind of openness to being in relationship. I'll say this last thing and then certainly turn it back over to you. For people of color, that will require deep work from us too. Many of us have um, been deeply impacted by internalized racism and we have fallen into these systems and ways of being which command our um, silence or quiet nature. Um, many of us have to be pushed to, to break our silences. Many of us um, have to crawl out of spaces that have kept us safe in order to be in relationship with white folks who may also be learning and making mistakes. So oftentimes in my experience, there's been this deep practice of really, really wanting indeed to be in deep, deep, beautiful relationships to be able to create these spaces of experimentation Except for me, as a person of color, I come into that space recognizing the history of experimenting on Black bodies in the United States. And so I need the white person to know that same history. I need them to know that this has been done, that trauma, racial trauma is in this space with us. And so then as I, as a person of color, have to say, okay. I'm going to have to trust God and a whole lot of other ancestors to be in this space with me because I'm not sure how deep this anti-racist has done their work, but I know God will hold me and I know God will hold us. And there is a way in which a faith has to be created moment by moment. And that practice, the practice of faith, particularly I'm speaking for me as a person of color, that's the work. And that's the work of prayer. That's the work of practice. That's the work of spiritual bathing. That's the work of putting oneself back together, the practice of self-compassion, the repair of a person of color's psyche so that they come into the space, even a space of difference with non-people of color, open enough for, in Christian terms, the spirit to move. In Buddhism, we might call open enough, aware enough that the mind is completely open into a state of, of being that one can see the Buddha very easily in every being around them, including a, a being who's embodied as a white person. So this kind of sacred way of walking through life, um, this is what is required. And this does not come from, in my, in my lovely little son's um, experiment with life, from watching cartoons or, you know, playing all the time. One has to do one's work in order to be able to be fully present with these practices. Mm, thank you. Those are such good words. Thank you. Wanda, uh, what are you seeing in the chat? I see one question. Are there more that I haven't seen? Well, I would just invite us, I, I'm going to invite Tamisa, if she's willing in a minute to unmute and speak her question, but I was wondering if we just want to take a minute to let things mm -hmm. settle. Um, because there's just been so much. And if you're like me and you've been listening actively, you might not have had time to formulate any kind of comment or response. So let's just take a minute to, um, to let things settle and then I'll invite, invite questions.
Denise, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Uh, sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. I'm sorry. I, I have class in like 30 minutes, but I'm really glad I get to ask this with my actual voice. Um, I was wondering if each of you could speak maybe to this question of um, the critique of human supremacy. I'm wrestling with it um, a little bit because of realities around Black non-being and the ontological terror of that and, you know, three-fifths of humanity. And so even the term human has been complicated for people who have been raised Black. So when I think about these kinds of conversations, I'm wondering if you could speak to how someone like me who's grappling with that, like how do I critique humanity when I wasn't, and I have ancestry that was not even included in that category for such a long time. And then I think my other question was specifically for Dr. Harris about, um, first of all, since I have you here, I love your book. <laughs> I, just, I read it this year. Um, and I, I wonder if you might speak a little bit more because you mentioned like something of a reconciliation between the black body and nature um, and the fact that our ancestors are, are caught up in that process. Um, I'm thinking a lot these days about Hush Harbor and how, nature was used to kind of hide our religious praxis and point to freedom, but also to terrorize us. And like, how do you, how do we, um, yes, how do we reconcile ourselves to that, um, to these questions about humanity and then also about relationship to, to the earth? I, I could respond briefly and then Melanie turn it over to you if that's okay or whatever, does that feel okay? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Denise. And also just to touch on what Cheryl put in the chat uh, as well. Cheryl's asking, uh, what do we do in our life rhythms to encourage living co cooperatively with the others and taking risks? Uh, for one, I have a three and a six-year-old uh, daughters and uh, doing the, the marriage thing. And so I have lots of opportunities in my own life just to notice my own reactions to different stresses and to try to slow down and listen. I happen to be a practicing Muslim, so just praying the five daily prayers creates an interruption in the usual human demand flow at like intentional pauses. Um, and then actually making it clear out loud repeatedly that I wish to live in accountability to my soul and destiny. That's a fundamental organizing principle in Yoruba cosmologies. It's fundamental in Islam. It's fundamental in any tradition I've ever encountered that we have unique individual soul level destiny that we need to be accountable to. You don't need to be like me. I don't need to be like you, but you need to be a damn good version of you. So it's like we're accountable to our own potential. So just saying that to the spirits, like hold me accountable and then staying non-reactive in my daily life are principles that are helpful to me. That's a short version uh, to just, you know, to speak in a general way to me. So of course I've had the same lived experience uh, to your question. Uh, but I'll say that when supporting folks, uh, let's say in the US of African ancestry is one of the things I've observed to be especially helpful is to make sure to connect directly with ancestors who lived before the period of the, the Mafa, the enslavement, the last 400, 500 years, and to know, in addition to the last, you know, the recent centuries, to know Black excellence and humanity in the recent centuries, and to not pick up the dehumanization as much as possible, even though it's baked into the systems, but to also know the Black excellence before the last 500 years. And a lot of the people that experienced enslavement were scholars, were leaders, they were leaders of, you know, empires for better or for worse, and like very uh, distinguished human beings. And that history often isn't taught here. And so that can at times be a corrective to know like a diversity of forms and faces and like, what are 25 different forms of black excellence that predate the European colonialism project? And to know how those feel in your body, to know that that's a direct ancestral transmission that you have access to. That can help to interrupt some of the um, toxicity that's so in the mix still. Uh, that's a short answer, but yeah, thanks. Thank you. I, um, I would agree. I think transmission is one of the most important 
practices that one can open themselves up to to receive guidance, but also um, to deepen. I really appreciate, Daniel, what you shared about um, being aware, right? observing our own reactivity. Um, it is the case, turning to your question, that um, eco-womanism has been challenged in part because it has been asked whether or not the entire approach is a reaction to white supremacy, um, whether it's a reaction to um, and how that reaction then unfolds in terms of an anthropology anthropological um, kind of way of being. This is important for eco-womanism to say, no, the earth matters and Black lives matter. Um, it is important to say that actually in this particular context, at least in the United States of America and in many places across the African diaspora, it's still important to say that human Black bodies do matter. Yes, it is important to look at all the ways in which um, humanity and the ways that we have debilitated the earth and those practices are baked in. Um, in the language that we're using here. And it's also important to recognize that there are multiple things going on, right? It's pretty complex. Um, there is a way in which assimilation, um, the presence of affluence in hip hop culture, for example, or in many, many aspects of African-American culture necessitate or assume um, a very um, climate unjust way of being. So I think here, and this is one of the gifts of going through the methodological steps of eco-womanism, um, you know, step three and step four really invite us to use an eco-womanist um, intersectional analysis, and then to really be critical about some of the traditions in our own practice in our own culture and our own religious tradition. So typically, um, my family comes from uh, way back in Ghana, West Africa, um, but I come from Mississippi roots. And in Mississippi, and summertime, when the family gets together, we often use a lot of Ziploc plastic bags to cover food, to give food to others in the neighborhood, to make sure that people have to eat. Um, and not just the, the families that are there at the reunion, but really feeding the entire community with all these Ziploc bags. So it was an interruption for me to say, no, no, family, we don't need to be using Ziploc bags. Um, and that practice of hospitality, radical hospitality, was what was the family was trying to protect that value. And so what I had to do was introduce to the family, there's a way to protect the value of radical hospitality without killing the planet. There is a way to do this without the use of and the over consumers use of plastic. And so those kinds of ways are the ways that sometimes within the culture, one has to name um, what can be interrupted? This is how we do earth justice in this particular, just this one small example um, in this particular way. But having the awareness that as a person of color, yes, you have the right to problematize any environmentalist who says, yeah, it's all humans. We don't need to look at racism. We don't need to look at sexism. We don't need to look at transphobia. We don't need to look at any of the isms. That's actually incorrect from an eco-womanist perspective, actually all of these logics of domination, they are all hurting the planet. And so then one has to come up as we have today, as Daniel was sharing, one has to come up with new ethical systems, new values, how one might, how might one be more loving? How might one live in deep solidarity with their neighbor? So surprisingly, for all of the loss and devastation and grief that came out of COVID for most of us, one thing that many of us share was this necessity to lean on your neighbor. Suddenly, Richard Niebuhr becomes very important. Who is your neighbor? Because we had to lean on the houses or the people or the neighbors around us because there was no other way to get through with that particular uh, pandemic. So recognizing there have been instances, periods, where humans have been given the chance to live in a deeper, different relationship with each other, we can see each other as human. 
I've just uh, finished watching Origins, which is, I'm sure all of you have seen it by now, but a fabulous movie um, really about the, the work of Cass, the book by Isabel Berkerson. And there is something significant about the fact that all of these different powerful leaders, mostly people of color, were able to see the intersection of the impact of the logic of domination with the key central focus on dehumanizing dehumanizing a person and actually created Isabel uh, Wilkerson really creates a study really of these kind of practices. And so race ends up being one of the ways in which we see it oftentimes here in the United States of America. But there is a true trueness to a caste system, the reality that we live in systems that are based on these hierarchies of personhood, humanness or not. Um, and some of that, I think, honestly, could be named as you could question that, right, in terms of does that mean that that entire system or even the study or wanting to disrupt that system falls into the trap of being anthropological? Is it just another practice of trying to um, undo a human problem? Maybe, but it needs to be undone. Thank you. I don't see other questions in the chat. And I, I wonder, Daniel, do we have enough time to do a practice? We have about eight minutes. That may not be enough. What are your thoughts about that? Yes, possible. Sure. OK. Um, we had talked about this before we started, that one of the regrets of the organizers and our regret as soon as we heard this is that we hadn't really created time for Daniel to, to lead us in a ritual practice. Um, an embodied practice. So um, would you be willing to do that with us now? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, so take not more than 10 minutes and I'll just talk you through a thing. If you would, do what helps you to shift your attention to your body, your breath, to be present with your heart, your belly, your feet. Do what helps you to be rooted in your body. And while that's happening, notice your connection directly with the sacred to your own guides, perhaps your loving ancestors, whatever you already know and trust as a way that you connect with the greater. Go ahead and attune to that or to those ones. from this embodied place, being connected to the sacred, take a minute to intend that your personal space is free from any negativity or interference, anything that doesn't need to be around you at this time. It could be a moment of just cleansing and reclaiming your personal space. And hold intent that there be a gentle layer of protection or containment around your space so that only what is loving and supportive for you is welcome into your immediate space at this time. And from this place of being rooted in your body, connected, clear, protected, Take a moment with your heart and your guidance and just listen what from our time today is actually useful and good medicine for you and your path. Is there anything that stands out intuitively for you? Take a minute and just listen.
and if something good is happening for you there, stay with that. Otherwise, I'll invite for just a moment to notice outside your circle, outside your personal space, that you, just like every other human being, is connected to all different kinds of ancestors. They're your ancestors of blood, chosen family, of culture, of land, of tradition, of vocation, etc. So just notice outside your space, you connected, whether you ever focus on it or do anything about it. There's just a lot of connections that you're wired in and entangled with the rest of humanity. So just notice that to begin with. And notice, if you would, that there's a whole wide spectrum among the dead. Some of them are quite at peace, and some of them are something other than that. And that's okay. So you hold intent in this moment that those that you're connected to, who are really safe and supportive for you and your life, that those ones are welcome to draw just a little closer to your circle still respecting your boundaries, but just that you, if it's true, that you welcome alignment with the loving and wise ancestors. And those who are really in need, may they get what they need, and may they give you just a little bit of breathing room. So you're inviting them to have just the one step back to yield a little bit in this moment for the wise and loving ancestors to just, just be a little bit closer to your space not right up in your space, but just around. And whether you know anything about them, see if you can on a felt level connect with the reality that you are connected to goodness and beauty and wisdom and good values and courage and the things that matter to you, that those are things that are also present in your lineages, even if it's been a minute. So they're also present in your body. They're part of your cultural inheritance. Whether you like or don't like your family or whatever it is recently, in the long arc of time, you're also connected to all that is beautiful and good about humanity. See if you can just notice that in an easy felt way. And in this place of just resting with this felt connection to goodness among your people, why don't we finish with just a, a moment or two of prayer? And so, you know, take what resonates with you and leave the rest. But with your people, may there be more love and kindness in the world. May there be more humility and real courage and love and kindness. May that increase through each of us, and may it increase on earth. May we each in our own ways participate in ending and composting systems of supremacy and harm, restriction and fear. May we each align with our distinct purpose and calling from the divine. And may we live that with humility, with an ethic of service and care and kindness. And may we be in solidarity with, with life in that way. May we know that we're not alone. So learn to, to be a team player in the deep, deep sense of that. 
would pause for a final moment for whatever prayers you want to layer in. And take a minute to just give thanks to any support that you called in spiritually and do what helps you to gently shift attention uh, out of the more dropped in listening space. Thank you all for your trust. It's a delight to be a part of the panel. Thank you, Melanie, Deborah, Honda. And thank you, Daniel, for giving us such a beautiful, beautiful benediction to this amazing time. I'm choked up. <laughs> thank you to all of our panelists for just so much richness that you brought to us, for the ways you've challenged us, for the ways you have um, invited us to expand our imagination, expand our relationships to one another and to the more than human world. This has definitely been a blessed gathering and I'm just so grateful for all of you. And I would invite anyone who would like to express appreciation in the chat or with an emoji or the American Sign Language sign of applause, um, whatever feels appropriate um, for you at this time. As we're wrapping up this session, I would remind you to please leave um, feedback for the session. Alex has put the link in the chat. So I invite you to respond to that. Um, and also invite you later to our welcome reception at eight o'clock Eastern um, and whatever time that is for the rest of the other time zones. Um, hopefully you can make that translation. Um, but so much appreciate this, this time for all who've gathered and uh, look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Wanda, for leading us. <laughs>